He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. It's great to have all of you here. Let me pray for us, and we'll move into the first part of this message for today. Oh God, we praise you for the resurrected Savior, who is now seated at the right hand of the Father, to whom all authority and power and dominion has been, has been given, both in heaven and on earth. And because of your finished work of death and resurrection, those who place their faith in you can rejoice in hope. Thank you for hope. Hope of a future with you. Hope that begins today a life with you. And oh God, I pray if there's anyone who is in this sanctuary or who is listening through the live stream, God, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, You would use the power of your resurrection to resurrect dead hearts, to raise the dead to life, to open blind eyes and let them see the light of the glorious gospel of Christ in the face of your Savior. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm not sure if you like uh, magic shows like I do. I, I kind of like uh, magic shows. Our family is actually watching uh, one on Netflix, a series. Um, and the, the, the cool thing about magic shows or illusions is that, that they take the things that are broken and they break them in front of you and then they fix them right there before you, before your very eyes. Now, now some are dramatic and some are less dramatic, like you know, cutting somebody in half and, and, and pulling the pieces apart and then putting it back together. Or, or putting somebody in a box and kind of rearranging all the parts and putting them on the stage and you still see the, the arms sticking out of the middle or the, the legs and you're like, oh my goodness, how are they going to put this back together? But you, you know it's just an illusion because you realize it's just a trick. And if that which was broken is not fixed by the end, it's no longer a magic trick. It's no longer entertainment. And we understand that in a magic show, it is called an illusion for a reason. And that's because of one of two things is happening. Either that which was, has the appearance of brokenness, wasn't ever really broken to begin with, or that which was broken or torn or ripped or sawn in two, is just replaced by uh, a substitute at the end of the, at the, at the, of the magic trick. There is real no healing or wholeness or repair that happens. It's just all an illusion. But this morning, because of the resurrection, we can celebrate true wholeness because of the the repair that Jesus has brought to our real brokenness. The brokenness that we have because of sin is true and real brokenness. It breaks the very foundations of our life. It, it, it strips from us and destroys our life and, and the lives of the people around us that we love. And it, it categorically destroys and demolishes the relationship that we can have with God. Sin severs that relationship. But through Jesus, his death and his resurrection, the sin that once broke and severed that relationship, we can enjoy Peace, shalom. Shalom that we find in the scripture is not just peace in terms of the freedom from conflict, but it is wholeness, the the repair that, that God intends to put all the pieces back together just the way they were intended to be. That's the shalom, the peace that God offers through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus who paid the penalty for sin on the cross. Life was spent for you so that you and I, through faith, could enjoy the life of Christ through his resurrection by faith in him. This morning, I want to just spend a few moments and walk through the resurrection story, the, the, the very beginning of this resurrection story, and I want to I connect it to our, our study in 1 Peter. It has three parts, uh, chapter 1, verses 10, 11, and 12, and we're going to take one section at a time. Just uh, to let you know, there, the, the next insol- installment of the study guide is in the back at the Welcome Center. We're going to continue this series beginning uh, next week. That is going to be called Transformed by Glory. But this morning, I want to just begin in verse 10 of 1 Peter chapter 1, just to remind you of what we're talking about. 
It says, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully. Now, I want to key in on the, the prophet's work of, of prophesying and testifying about the grace that you and I would receive. The, this great salvation. We're going to spend our time in Matthew chapter 28. I would encourage you, if you have your Bibles, please turn there with me. Matthew 28, beginning in verse 1. It says this. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. Now remember that Jesus had died on Friday, just hours before the Sabbath, which took place from 6 p.m. on Friday to 6 p.m. on the Saturday, uh, our our normal Saturday. Passover uh, was now complete, and it was early on Sunday morning. Matthew says it was, it was towards the dawn. Mark and John fill this out for us, and, and we find out that it was very early on the first day of the week. The sun had not been risen, and it was still dark. Sometime between three in the morning and six o'clock in the morning, these women began to make their way to the tomb. We find that Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were part of the company, and from Mark chapter 16, we, we find also that there was another person, Salome, who was the mother of James and John. They went to the tomb, but they had a purpose in mind. Not just to see the body of Jesus, but to anoint that body of Jesus that we find in Luke 24 and also in Mark 16, 1. It says, they brought spices so they might go and anoint him. Preparation would likely have taken hours. And just after the Sabbath had finished on Saturday around 6 in the evening, the markets would be open for just a couple of hours. And and during that uh, segment of time, these ladies must have gone to purchase all the supplies they needed to begin putting together this spice to anoint the Savior. We know that it must have taken them hours to accomplish because Nicodemus, who anointed the body at Jesus' death, had 75 pounds of this ointment that he prepared the body of Jesus with. So, so these three women were necessary not only to prepare these, these ointments, but, but also to carry and haul them to the tomb in order to anoint the body of Jesus. But there was one burning question in their mind. We find in Mark 16, 3, it says, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And that's when it happened. That's when their concerns begin to fade away uh, and without their even knowing it. God was knocking down the barriers that would get in the way of faith and vision. He was accomplishing this through an earthquake that we find in verse 2. Behold, it says in verse 2, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. On their way, there was this earthquake. And an earthquake that that they would have also experienced just a couple of days before when Jesus was on the cross. In his final moments, his final words were, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And in that moment, the earth shook, the veil was torn. And the rocks were split and the tombs were open. We find that in Matthew 27, 51 to 52. Behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks were split, the tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. That which prevented the priests from being able to access the Holy of Holies that veil, that curtain that was in the way, now was torn and the, and the presence of God was, was able to be experienced to the max. No more was there a barrier between the priest, the holy place, and the holy of holies. This happening according to the prophetic word. Jesus, just a few days earlier, on the entrance into Jerusalem, begins, the the crowds are crying out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the the Pharisees are are disturbed and, and frustrated. And they say to Jesus in Luke 19, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. 
And in this moment, the stones cry out, the power of God on display, the glory of God echoed through the work of his son and uh, harmonized in the response of the earth. The rocks crying out, the work is finished and complete in Jesus. But here in verse 2, we find a great earthquake, which would have been greater in terms of magnitude and breadth. The cause for this earthquake, we find in verse 2, an angel of the Lord descended from heaven. And the result was threefold. We find first a terrified guard. For fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. First barrier removed, and not even a barrier that the women knew anything about. But God systematically knocking over the barriers so these women could see the tomb. Second, it triggered a series of events with the chief priests. We find in in, uh, verses 11 to 15 that some of the guard went into the city, took the chief priest, or told the chief priests all that had taken place. And third, the angel came and rolled back the stone from the tomb and sat on it. Second barrier removed. Tomb opened. Faith enlarged. Opportunity to see the evidence of a risen Savior Opportunity is now there. And these women who came in sorrow were now beginning a journey of joy. We find in verse 5. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. The angelic confirms, or the angel confirms, the, the prophetic revelation of Jesus And fills this out, we find even more in Luke 24, verse 5. This is the angel's words in more detail. They were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground. The men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the third, and on the third day he would rise. Jesus fulfilled the prophetic word that he had given. The tomb was empty. Jesus was no longer there. And also the prophetic word of David from Psalm 16, verse 10. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. And so on this morning, we celebrate. We celebrate a risen Savior, confirmed by angels confirmed by these three women, confirmed by the, 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 the Roman soldiers who were there at the tomb, confirmed by disciples, confirmed by over 500 of those who witnessed the risen Lord, and confirmed by everyone who bows the knee to Jesus and experiences the resurrecting power, the life-giving power over sin, over bondage, wholeness that can be yours through faith In Jesus Christ. As we continue, let me remind you uh, what it says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 11. It says, The prophets were inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. Let's see how that ties into what we're looking at in Matthew 28, starting with verse 7, verses 7 through 10, where the angel speaking to the woman says, Then go quickly. Tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Now, again, just think about what's happened, okay? These women are on their way to the tomb, and there's an earthquake, okay? A great earthquake. Not only that, it's caused because an angel has come to roll the stone away. An angel, which is described as having an appearance of lightning, radiant, white like snow, so terrifying that these manly men, the Roman soldiers, become like dead men. Now, I don't know if that means that they, they are frozen with fear or they faint dead away, but they're terrified. Even the angel himself has to say to the women, do not be afraid. And then they hear the good news. Jesus is not dead. He's risen. 
And then they're commissioned to go and tell the disciples that they will get to see him in Galilee. So these women take off running full of adrenaline from both fear and joy. When all of a sudden they come to this man on the road and they fall down at his feet and worship. Now, isn't that a little strange? They'd seen this angelic being that has the appearance of lightning and they're not tempted to worship him. But they meet this man on the road and immediately fall at his feet in worship. That lets us know there's something truly extraordinary about this man. And as we see, these women had been at the cross when Jesus was crucified. And they were there and observed uh, his death just in such an extraordinary way that even the soldiers themselves remark on it. Notice what it says in Matthew 27, verses 50 and 54 through 56. It says, and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe. And they said, truly, this was the son of God. There were also many women there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to them, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. You see, they were there when Jesus died in an extraordinary way. The women were also there when he was laid in the borrowed tomb. These women knew without a doubt that Jesus was dead and gone. But now, to meet him on the way is, is obviously more than enough for them to be ecstatic, to be overwhelmed, to be overjoyed, to have a million questions. But is it really enough for them to worship him? It's not the first resurrected person that they've seen. But there's more, right? Surely as they were running on the way to tell the disciples, they began to consider and remember all the things that that Jesus had said, that Pastor Andrew talked about, all of the times he said he would die and on the third day he would raise again. And maybe they began to consider also the prophetic utterances, the things they had known most of their lives about the Messiah, things like Isaiah 53, verses 10 and 11 which was written 700 years before this day, but surely they knew it. It said, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He's put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring and he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. You see, when these women come across Jesus, they also know without a shadow of a doubt that this is the risen, glorified Son of God. So they fall face down before him, grasping his feet in worship. And notice Jesus doesn't stop them. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it Isn't it beautiful that these women who had followed Jesus through his ministry, were there at his death, were there when he was buried, are now coming this morning to care for his dead body. And as a result, they are given the honor of being the first ones to worship him as the glorified Christ. But they won't be the last. Not long from now, we'll see that Jesus also appears to the disciples. And they too will worship him as the glorified Christ. However, the most stunning picture we have in all the scripture of worship to the glorified Christ is found in Revelation 5. And in Revelation 5, Jesus is standing in the throne room of heaven after returning to heaven. And everyone there realizes only Jesus is able to open the scroll that contains all of God's future plans. And when they realize that, all of heaven erupts in worship. And it says, and they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll to open its seals for you are slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation And you've made them a kingdom and priests to our God. And they all shall reign on earth. Then I looked and I heard around the throne, the living creatures and the elders and the voices of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. 
And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. You see, these women were the first to worship, but they won't be the last. You know, before we talk about though, let me just point out one thing that's so easy to miss. In Matthew 28, 10, notice this. It says, Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee and there they will see me. It's so easy for us to zip past that word brothers. But, but think about how amazing it is that Jesus calls these men his brothers You know, they had just abandoned him in the garden when he had been arrested, right? Peter had just boldly three times denied even knowing Jesus. And and except for John, none of the disciples are anywhere to be found when Jesus is crucified, right? I mean, all the betrayal, the failure, the disappointment, and now Jesus calls them by a name that's more intimate than any he had previously used. Before they were friends, but now they're brothers. You know, the resurrection itself is a testimony to the fact that Christ has finished what he came to do, that he's paid for all of our sins, that he's taken the prison sentence of eternity and hell for us, and now has walked free from the grave. There's no guilt left unpaid. But this change in terms, this this use of the word brothers, is another evidence that Jesus had finished what he came to do. Paul talks about that in Galatians 4, verses 3 through 7. He says, In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. You see, in calling them brothers, Jesus clearly emphasizes that all of the benefits they received and we received from the resurrection was not based on their work, right? They just had disappointed him. They had failed him. They had fled from him. But Jesus in his faithfulness had accomplished what needed to be done. And so all that he gained through the resurrection, was not for himself alone, but for all of us who put our faith in him. So this morning, if you have not put your faith in Jesus, if you have not accepted his call to become his brother or sister, let me challenge you to consider again the condition of your soul. Philippians 2, 8 through 11, Paul says, And being found in human form, Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, every single person at some point Every person here, every person who's ever existed, every person who will exist at some point will bow their knee to Jesus Christ as Lord. The question is, will you bow to him today as a loving older brother, or will you bow to him then as an enemy of the conquering king? Those are the only two options. If you have not experienced adoption into God's family, if you would like to know more about that, please don't leave today without talking to one of us or or talking to somebody who brought you, let us help lead you towards an intimate relationship with Jesus as your brother and able to worship the glorified Christ. So as we jump into this passage, I want to begin um, just kind of setting a little bit of background for you to recognize that even though sequentially these next few verses we're going to read are very close together to the resurrection, likely historically there could have been three or four weeks of time that pass between this passage we're going to study and the passages that you've heard taught already this morning. So we're going to take a look there, Matthew 28, and we're going to begin in verse 16 and read verses 16 through 20. Here's what they say. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. 
but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go and make disciples. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So as we look at this passage this morning, I want us to recognize the fact that Jesus' resurrection gives us confidence to accomplish what he has commanded. Now, the context here is kind of important. You know, for many of us, you hear the name Galilee, and that's just like a Bible place, right? It's just over in Israel somewhere. But it was significant to recognize that Galilee was a five to seven day journey from Jerusalem. So it would have taken some time to get there. Jesus had done a lot of ministry in Galilee, and many of his disciples were there from Galilee, including some famous ones like Peter and Andrew. Uh, Galilee was known for the Sea of Galilee, where there's a significant fishing um, economic boom there, okay? So this was really a, a, a really important part of Jesus's ministry. The other thing that was significant about Galilee is there were a lot of Gentiles there. And so the fact that Jesus went to Galilee and gave this commission and this command to his disciples meant that this message of good news was going out not just to Israel, but to the Gentiles and to the nations beyond. Now, this was, when did this happen? Again, this was not Jesus' first appearance, even though sequentially in this passage it looks like that. But as we look at the other Gospels, we recognize that Jesus appeared to the disciples a couple of times in uh, Jerusalem, as well as some scenarios where he shows up when they're fishing. So likely this would have happened. Acts tells us that Jesus was on earth for about 40 days after his resurrection teaching. Uh, this probably would have happened in the last 10 days or so before Jesus ascended. Uh, we also see who is there. Well, if you look a little earlier in the passage in chapter 28, look at verse 7, and you see there the angel tells the two women, um, he's going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. So this angel assumes within this passage that those women were going to be a part of the group of people that would see Jesus in, the, in this passage. Then skip forward a couple verses in verse 10, and Jesus himself says, go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. And there they will see me. Again, when Jesus is speaking about his brothers, he certainly was including the 11 apostles, but likely meant all those who were following him, all of his disciples. Now, you might ask, why is this important? Well, 1 Corinthians 15, 5 through 6 helps us expand even the scope a little bit larger. In verse 5, it says this. Um, Paul is recounting all of the resurrection uh, story to the Corinthian church, and he says that Jesus appeared to Cephas, that is Peter, then to the twelve. Verse 6, then he appeared to more than 500 other brothers at one time. So why does this matter? Well, I want you to recognize that this passage is not just a command Jesus gave to the spiritual elite. Okay, he didn't say, hey, you guys are the apostles. You're the all-stars at this, so this is important. This was a command that was given to his church. This was the mission that he set out for us, is to go and make disciples. So let's take a look at the command. Jump with me, and we're going to look at verse 19, and here's what it says. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So let's look at that first word there, go. This is not a passive word. This is an active word. This word requires being proactive. This Greek idea really had this, this um, sort of sense of beginning or departing for a journey. And so when Jesus is saying, go make disciples, he's not saying, wait to make disciples. He's not saying, let them come knocking down the doors to you. But he's saying, you go, disciples, be proactive in getting the message out and going and telling others about what I've done. The other thing that we see is, what does it mean to make disciples, right? So it's go, make disciples. These are easy words that can become kind of our, our Christianese that we're very comfortable with. But discipleship, really simply put, is this, someone who submits to Jesus as Lord and a savior. So first of all, what do I mean? Submitting to Jesus as Lord. This really has to do with recognizing that Jesus is the one that gets to set the direction for our life. He's calling the shots, not me, not you. And so when I submit to Jesus as Lord, that means that all of my priorities are now sifted through the lens of his word that he's given us. The second part is calling on Jesus as savior. That means that no matter how hard I try, Nothing I do on my own can make me good enough to earn God's favor. I have failed and I cannot ever redeem or rectify that on my own. It is only through Jesus saving me through his death on my behalf that I can experience a renewed and a reconciled relationship with God. So 
Those are the two essential elements of what it means to be a disciple. And as we think about this as a church, we've put this in a really simple phrase. It's help uh, to, to make disciples is to help everyone move one step closer to Jesus. So who will this be? We'll keep reading on through the passage there. Jesus said, make disciples of all nations. This word here is ethne. This is every people group, every language. That's who we're supposed to take the gospel to and see disciples made. To those who are far and to those who are near. There are a lot of ethnes that are here in our own neighborhoods and communities in Columbus. That means taking it to the great, to the small, to the rich, to the poor. The gospel, the making of disciples is meant for everyone. So the next thing Jesus says is to make disciples, and then the, the first element of that is baptizing them in the name of our Trinitarian God, right? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And baptism really carries with it two important elements. The first one is repentance. When we are baptized, we are showing a turning from the old way that we used to live, and now moving to a new way. And this, that new way is about being in Christ. It symbolizes the fact that our identity is now wrapped up in who Jesus is. And so baptism is so important as we make disciples, this public identity of being in Jesus. And then Jesus says, baptizing them and teaching them. Well, teaching them what, you might ask? Well, Jesus said, all that I've commanded you, to observe all that I've commanded you. The idea here is that we are to seek after holiness as he is holy. But we recognize that that's not something we're able to do on our own. The gospel, you see, the gospel that saves us is the same gospel that sanctifies us. We recognize that we are saved by grace through faith. And we are sanctified. That is, we are made holy by grace through faith. It's not something we can do in our own strength. It comes from a dependence and a reliance upon him. The other thing we see is we kind of lace this back and connect this to last week. We looked at 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12. We see that making disciples isn't about us. This is what the prophets picked up early on. And if you see there, 1 Peter 1, 12 says this. It was revealed to them, that is the prophets, that they were not serving themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. And so we recognize that just like the prophets of old, discipleship isn't about us. It is about taking the gospel out to others, looking to help others grow in their faith and their love for Jesus and becoming more like him. So, you know, maybe, maybe you're like me, maybe, maybe you're not, but when I hear and I start to talk about the intricacies of discipleship, I start to feel like some of those tension knots in my neck and shoulders sometimes. You start to get that feeling in the pit of your stomach and you go, man, if this is really what the Bible teaches, this is a lot. This is a big thing. And it's easy to become overwhelmed by the immensity of what discipleship is. Now, I want to draw your attention to an interesting phrase here in this passage. Look backwards before Jesus gives this command in verse 17. And here's what it shows, right? The resurrected, glorified Jesus shows up. Boom. And here's what we see happens. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Has this ever been true for you? Have you ever doubted before? You've seen God do something incredible in your own life or in the life of somebody around you, but you still doubt, you still question, right? This is part of our frailty as humans. The word here for doubt in the Greek was also used earlier in Matthew, Matthew chapter 14, verse 12, when we see Peter uh, going out to walk on the water. And Jesus says, or Peter says to him, hey, if it's you, tell me to come walk on the water. And Jesus goes, come on out. And Pete's like, okay, takes a couple steps, and all of a sudden he looks around the wind and the waves and goes, whoa, right? And he starts questioning questioning if Jesus actually has the power to do what he said he was going to do. And at that point, we see this doubt happen, and he begins to sink in the water, right? Now, why, why is this important? Well, for us, sometimes when we think about disciple-making, it can be very overwhelming. And maybe we doubt God. Maybe we doubt, first of all, is God able to do this? How many of you have been in a relationship with somebody before, a friendship, where you've invested in them, you've poured into them, and then they go and do something really silly? And you're like, ugh. Didn't we just talk about this, right? Um, or maybe you've had a relationship and you just want to see God do something incredible in somebody's life and you think, but God, are you willing to do this? Here's what I can tell you. God does not promise us that our lives will be safe, comfortable, and easy. But I want to just draw three of the hundreds of promises that he has given us in his word, okay? The first one is James 1, 5. And it says this, If any of you lacks wisdom, let, he, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach. And it'll be given to him. Did you know that when you're in a difficult situation, when you're discipling somebody and you're just not sure what to say or what to do, God will give you wisdom if you ask for it. 
Let's look at the second one here. In James 4, 6, it says this, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. That when we need grace for our shortcomings, for the times that we fail, we mess it up, if we will humble ourselves, that God pours that grace out upon us. The third one here is from Hebrews 13, 5, where he says this, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. There is comfort for us knowing that the difficulties of life that we are going to walk through, we don't have to walk through alone. That if we are a follower of Jesus, he will be with us no matter how dark, how hard, how lonely, how desperate we feel, he will be with us. So how do we overcome these doubts? Well, let's see what happens in this passage here. We recognize that it is the power of the word of God that overcomes doubt. Maybe you're like me. Maybe you're more spiritual. You ever had that moment where you're sitting with your Bible and you're like, man, I just wish Jesus was here this morning. I would have made an extra cup of coffee. We could sit and chat. This would be so cool. But I guess I'll just settle for the Bible, right? Well, look at this. In this scenario, Jesus himself, the glorified Jesus, shows up and they doubted. And what was it that calmed their doubts? It was Jesus' word, right? And here's what he says to them. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Look, what I've called you to do, I have the power to do. And I'm going to finish what I'm asking you to do. I will give you the strength to do it. As Jesus' disciples, we can't go at it alone. We have to rely on him and know that he will be with us. Verse 20 says, And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We know in John 17, Jesus said the way that was going to happen was through sending the helper, the Holy Spirit, who dwells within us. We can know that we're not alone, that he will strengthen us and give us the wisdom and the uh, power that we need through whatever situations life brings. So in conclusion, I just want to ask this question. How will you respond today to Jesus? Is your life marked by fear? hesitancy, doubt? Are you willing to step out in faith and obey what he has commanded us to do, to go and make disciples of all nations, knowing that the risen Savior, that God punctuated the authority that he had given to Jesus by raising him from the dead and saying, look, I've done the greatest miracle of all, and he has the power. I've put it on display for the whole world to see. God, help that to be true in our lives today and to change the way that we live.